All right, this is our official start. My name is Adam Lerner. I am the founder of Solvable, and I am joined by my colleague and our coaching practice lead, May Bartlett, who will be co-hosting this conversation with Darcy Winslow with Rebecca Henderson. It's important in our work that we continually honor and acknowledge the land that supports us and the cultures that have been in relationship with this land for millennia. Uh, I sit in what is known as Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, the ancestral, unceded, and current lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth nations. The Solvable team is really privileged to be holding this virtual space for not only what is an important topic, which is regenerative leadership, but also perhaps the more significant activity of building relationality between global communities and between each of us living in the living systems that surround us. Our teams consider these containers and holding change the most vital work we can do to support the cultural shifts needed for transition into a different way of inhabiting the planet. We invite participation in different ways of knowing and May will be shortly leading us through a centering exercise which is intended to ground ourselves and our bodies inside what is often a very disembodied space here in Zoom with all of our little squares. We created the Container of New Works as a series specifically to celebrate important voices, build communities, and shift perspectives. Today, you'll be, have the opportunity to be part of generative conversations with others who share conviction and interest in the space. Uh, we'll have two breakouts specifically, a very short one at the beginning, and then a, a longer one at, after the conversation with uh, Rebecca, uh, where you'll get to uh, meet others. And I invite you to use the chat and thank you for everybody who's sharing in the chat now to keep it lively, share resources and other things that are coming up for you in the conversation. The topic of leadership is perhaps a fitting culmination to our series because this is the last of eight conversations that we've started in early November on regeneration. The changing nature of leadership uh, in response to the myriad social and planetary crises around us is a kind of unifier for the many discussions that we've been having. And given that Dr. Henderson wrote Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire before the pandemic, which is hard to believe, we often forget that there was a time before the pandemic, uh, and was released just a couple of months after the pandemic really took hold, I'm particularly interested to hear how her thinking about leadership has evolved over the past 22 months by what we've all been experiencing. I would like to say how grateful we are to be co-hosting this conversation with dear friend, uh, Darcy Winslow, who's been working on systems leadership now for a couple of decades, initially through her work at Nike, and then as the uh, lead for the Academy for Systems Change, and now with her sub-project as part of the Academy, Magnolia Moonshot 2030. Darcy, welcome, and would you like to share a few words about Magnolia Moonshot? Sure. Um, so Magnolia Moonshot 2030 was born out of a recognition of how women show up as leaders and specifically, it started in the space of sustainability. But as I began to engage other women colleagues of mine, we really centered on how we need to support and amplify women's voices to really look for and galvanize solutions that will serve all. And uh, we're specifically focused on climate justice, uh, and achieving the IPCC climate goals around 2030, the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030, and equity and equality in all forms. And it's really about supporting and working with women and girls of all ages. Uh, and working with teen girls has been absolutely amazing, especially in Europe and Pakistan, as they will be some of our next leaders. So it's very emergent and collaborative, inclusive, and it's just been the work of my life. Thank you, Darcy. We will share some resources about what Magnolia Moonshot is up to and make sure in the, when we share the recording after this conversation, we'll also include some links to that. So if, um, if you're interested in, uh, in the spaces of female leadership and the, uh, that Darcy's talking about, I encourage everyone to get involved. I would also like to, in, introduce uh, Dr. Rebecca Henderson, who really bears no introduction for many of the people on this call. Uh, Dr. Henderson is the university professor of Harvard Business School and a research fellow at the Bureau of, Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow of both the British Academy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
Her research explores the degree to which the private sector can play a major role in building a more sustainable economy and focusing particularly on the relationship between organizational purpose, innovation, and productivity in high-performing organizations. For several years, she taught a course that was the impetus for this book called Reimagining Capitalism, Business, and the Big Problems. Uh, a course that uh, drew, uh, I think it started, it said at 28 students and grew to many hundreds at, uh, at Harvard, um, and then inspired her to write the book that we'll be talking through today. She's also the, the, uh, the author of two other books, one of which is actually how I discovered um, uh, Dr. Henderson's work, which was Leading Sustainable Change, an organizational perspective. And if you have not read that book, I highly encourage you to do so. She also wrote a book on energy innovation called Accelerating Energy Innovation, Insights from Multiple Sectors. Oh. So we welcome you here, Rebecca, and uh, we're so glad you're, you're with us and thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we are going to go through a, um, May is going to lead us through a centering exercise to land in this space together, and then we are going to go into a very short five minute breakout, um, and then we will come back into conversation with uh, Darcy and May. So over to you, May. Great. Hi, everyone. So go ahead and take a moment just to get comfortable wherever you're seated. You can close your eyes if that feels good for you, or you can just keep a soft gaze at the floor. And take a moment to turn your attention inward, noticing your breath inside of your lungs. Feeling your feet on the floor and your back against your chair. Waking up to this present moment. And I invite you to remember a time when you have shown up as your best leader. And try not to think too hard about it. Just notice what memory pops into your mind when you think about being a leader. And let yourself travel back in time to that experience and relive it for a few moments. As you show up there, notice where you are. What can you see around you? What sounds can you hear? What smells fill the air? And how are you showing up as a leader in this moment? What is it that you're doing? If there are other people there, how are you interacting with them? Notice how you feel in this moment. What physical sensations are present? What emotions might you be experiencing? And what's your current mental state? How do you view the world around you and others? How do you view yourself and the role you're playing? What qualities are you embodying in this moment? Is there one word that captures how you're showing up as a leader?
take a few more moments to soak it all in, reliving this experience as best as you can. And as you're ready, let yourself travel back to the present moment, bringing these sensations and qualities with you into this conversation and time that we have together and into the rest of your day. And once again, feel your feet on the floor and your back against your chair. Reconnect with your breath inside of your lungs. And in your own time, you can open your eyes and rejoin the group. So now you're going to have an opportunity to go into a brief breakout room, just five minutes or so, so you can uh, make connections with people in the space. So your prompt for this first breakout is, how do you understand regenerative leadership? When you hear that phrase, what comes up for you? So uh, enjoy the conversation and we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Welcome back. We'll get started in just a moment as everyone has a chance to trickle back in from breakout. I hope that you got to meet someone new and please throughout this conversation use the chat liberally. So feel free to share anything that came up in breakouts or if questions arise while we're in conversation, put them in the chat. There'll be uh, an opportunity at the end of our time together uh, for you to ask Rebecca questions through the chat. So uh, please, like I said, use liberally. All right, Darcy, you back with us and Rebecca? I am back. Yes, it's Roberta or Roberta, Rebecca. Where is Rebecca? She got lost in a breakout. There we go. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I am so honored to get to reconnect with a, an old colleague. Not old, you're not old. <laughs> Wrong idea, Darcy. <laughs> a colleague, uh, we met many years ago when I was doing some work at MIT as a senior lecturer, and uh, that's where I had the pleasure of meeting Rebecca. So um, it's great to now kind of reconnect on this topic. And Rebecca, the first question is really uh, just kind of a, a lift from the question everyone was just wrestling with. And I'm curious how you might define regenerative leadership and how you differentiate that from sustainability leadership. Darcy, thank you. Um, and I feel I'm cheating because I was in a wonderful breakout group where we had a really interesting discussion of this question. Uh, so my view has been informed by that. But um, I think of sustainable leadership as about trying to make sure we don't make things worse. So about arresting the damage, stopping the problem. And I think of regenerative leadership as about accepting responsibility for not just doing no harm, but trying to make it better. Literally regenerating what we have, uh, whether it's our people, which James in my breakout group really stressed, or whether it's just building a continually generative economy and society, which Johanna mentioned. Um, I think it's a stress on building and growing and not just policing the damage. How does that sound? Because that's not quite your definition, no? Well, no, no. And we talked about this a little bit before that there is no one definition of regenerative leadership. And I think it's a very emergent idea. And one of the uh, phrases that was used in my breakout is how we deconstruct our traditional image of what leadership means. And for me, and what we're practicing now within the uh, Magnolias is this shared rotating collaborative leadership model where after four or five months, others in the group will roll into this smaller group of what we call lead geese because you know geese fly in formation. And when the, the front geese get tired, they fall to the back and someone else takes over. And it's been a fascinating uh, experiment to get all voices into that leadership role um, and to get all perspectives. 
And uh, just one other uh, thing that I'd love to have you comment on is part of the traditional leadership is how do we fix this problem to your point about let's not make things worse. And to really juxtapose this problem solving orientation where it does become reductionistic and siloed uh, to this future vision, this creative orientation of what is the future we want to create together. And I think that helps move us beyond how sustainability has uh, traditionally been seen. Well, I'd love to riff a little bit on how I see leadership changing because I think it's very related to you, but I would, I'd like to bump out the circle a bit and I, I'm curious how you'd feel about that. So as I think about how leadership is changing, I think, yes, we need to move from fixing what we have to looking out to being more creative. We need to move from a world in which, and I come from a business background, but the goal is to make myself rich or my company rich or my shareholders rich to reclaim the idea that the goal is to build a thriving and healthy society on a thriving and healthy planet. And that's really a shift for leaders, right? And I think it, wait, it gets worse. You can't lose sight of the fact that we still have to run our daily lives and we have to balance. Yes, I have to be absolutely a traditional leader in the sense of what are our goals? Where are we going to keep track of the money? But I also have to be creative and inspiring and aware of the larger picture. And then you added to that, and it's all of us. I yeah. happen to be holding the leadership role, but maybe someone else will step into it. Maybe I should be, I think, distributing power as much as I can and really creating uh, what I call a high road organization or a high commitment organization where we treat everyone with dignity and respect and everyone has some say over what they do and right. has a place to stand. Um, and then just for fun, can I add one more thing to this list? Absolutely. I think, and I think two years ago before the pandemic, I wouldn't have said this in public, but now it's clear that it's so important one has to say it. Real leadership means working on yourself as well, mm. it means having control of your own stuff, or at least some sense of what your own stuff is. That as we look for new models of leadership, we need to think as much about how we show up and who we are as about, you know, I'm the leader. And, uh, you know, I remember perhaps you've run into the McKinsey partner from the San Francisco office who said, CEOs are coming to me and saying it's about being, not just doing, mm -hmm. which, which is really a shift, really a shift. But I think it's an essential part of the puzzle too. I, I totally agree. And in the Academy for Systems Change, we always talked about the inner and the outer work of leadership. And that inner work, you know, all change starts with self and understanding how we individually influence others and systems around us. And that gives us a choice of how we want to show up every day. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I like this balance of balancing it, the individual leadership with the collaborative. And I know you talk about that in your book, Rebecca, that, you know, value-based and purpose-based organizations need to also be collaborative in order to shift the capitalism in the way that we need to. And so I'd love to explicitly bring that into the conversation too. You know, what role can regenerative leadership play in shifting capitalism in a way that's going to work for everyone? In two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll set the timer. Um, okay. I think if we're going to build a regenerative society and a regenerative world, we need more than just change within business. So let me just say that because some people imply that business can do everything. And I think Darcy, you and I both believe it's not just business alone, but I think business can be a really important ally and friend. How? Well, individual firms can demonstrate inside their own organizations what it means to lead in this way and to do things in a really different way. Um, one of my friends, Bob Chapman, runs a firm called Barry Waymuller which makes very uninteresting things in the Midwest, cardboard boxes and toilet paper and stuff like that. 
it's been growing at 18% a year for the last 10 years, something like that, maybe more. And Bob ascribes it, who's the CEO, he says he decided to run the organization as if everyone, every employee was someone's precious child, which is a total shift. And I mean, that reverberates throughout the organization in many different kinds of ways. But, but once you have one firm doing that and people see that happening, that can, that can uh, propagate out. And we're seeing, of course, wonderful examples across all kinds of firms. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, May, and this is where you went, is as firms start to act in this new way, I think it becomes increasingly clear they need friends and allies. So Darcy, you worked at Nike, right? You work out you cannot clean up the textile supply chain, the apparel supply chain, without working with all the other firms who are also buying from these factories and working this problem. And so one of the things that regenerative capitalism can do is really stimulate cooperation across networks of firms to address issues like diversity and um, labor abuse in the supply chain and reducing carbon emissions. Because if everyone does it together, then it becomes pre-competitive. I'm not at a disadvantage if I treat my employees well and cut my carbon emissions. And then last but not least, and this is really aspirational, my hope is that firms on this wavelength can really help to shift our society, can support strong institutions like free media and democratic institution, uh, democratic elections, can support employees in becoming civically engaged in the places that they live. Um, business is supposed to be, I'm not sure I believe this, but according to Edelman, the most trusted institution on the planet, which is a little scary. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think a majority of people globally say the single institution they trust the most is the firm they work for. So that's incredible power. Um, and if we can build a regenerative movement, if, well, we have one, if we can accelerate it and make it even bigger and more comprehensive, I think it could be potentially really transformational across the whole system. Thank you for bringing in the, the systems piece because you're right, change needs to happen from all of these different avenues. It can't just be business. And I, I get really inspired by the ideas that you share and you know this shift toward more purpose-driven businesses and capitalism. And the thing that I'm grappling with that continues to kind of nag at me as I think about these ideas is the trying to reconcile kind of what you said at the beginning, right? We still have to have traditional leadership models and have companies make profits and grow and, you know, benefit the shareholders while also infusing value and purpose and having a positive impact on the planet. And I look at some recent examples like Alan Jope or Emmanuel Faber, and it makes me question, you know, how can those two things live in the same world or has the foundation that we've built for capitalism that is about growth and profits and more 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 um is that is that getting in the way of trying to work on things like climate and social justice and how can how can they live in the same space is just something that i grapple with <laughs> Oh dear, I wish we could go out for lunch and have a big cup of coffee and really talk this through, you know. Um, but let me let me give you some preliminary thoughts. First, the fact that a couple of CEOs or more, um, you know, it hasn't been entirely smooth sailing, that doesn't disprove the basic idea. There are lots of firms that focus on nothing but making profits and they fail or don't do so well. You know, this is a hard world with lots of uncertainty. Um, I myself think Alan is doing a fantastic job at Unilever. And um, I think, you know, at Danone, that was, you know, a really interesting shift, but whoa, some business decisions perhaps were not the best. So yes, we have to keep our eye both on the bottom line and where we're trying to go. There will be firms for whom that's difficult to do, but we have many examples and I think increasing amounts of research to suggest it is absolutely possible to make money and to operate in this new way. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, yes, you're right, May, we have to change the rules of the game. Because it's not going to be the case that every CEO and every investor is going to wake up tomorrow and go, whoa, regeneration. It's just not going to happen. 
And so what we need is to change the rules of the game so that firms, forgive me, have to do the right thing. Mm. That means, for example, regulating carbon emissions or policies like minimum wage, um, making sure that when firms maximize profits, they're not tempted to do so in destructive ways. Um, I mean, you know, you've read my book, but the whole idea that if we maximize profits, it maximize social welfare is only true if so-called externalities are properly priced. If I'm running a coal company and every time I say, sell a lump of coal, I cause more damage to human health and the climate than my total revenues, which at the moment is approximately true, I'm not maximizing social welfare. So we have to change the rules of the game as well. But if we can do both, if we can get that internal change and the external regulatory change at the same time, then we can absolutely get to where we want to go. I mean, May, you wouldn't ask the question, you wouldn't do what you're doing unless you know we have the technology and the resources to solve the problems we face, to give everyone on the planet a decent living wage, security and enough to eat and uh, reverse the environmental damage. I mean, we won't fix climate change, which, by the way, we should officially call climate weirding, but, but we can arrest it, we can ameliorate it, we have the resources to do that. I, I, I'd love to jump in here. I love the, the framing of we have to change the rules of the game. And years ago, I read, you know, the clock of the long now and the rules of finite and infinite games. And typically in business, in the world in general, we have played the game under the finite rules. I win, you lose. And the rules of an infinite game flip that. There are no winners and losers and the game doesn't end and the rules continue to change so that the game can continue in perpetuity. And in talking about business, uh, Rebecca, one of the things I really loved about how you framed it are the different types of innovation. And if you can take off, you know, all the sensors and really kind of say, here's where I believe corporations are right now in the context of architectural innovation, radical disruptive innovation, and then the incremental innovation. And where this really resonated with me was when I, you know, started a lot of our sustainability work at Nike, taking that radical disruptive um, approach to setting our goals. We want 100% of this, zero of that. Anything in between was the incremental. But then the architectural innovation, which I didn't have the words for that, that is when you really start looking at the entire universe of, uh, you know, in the sports and fitness industry, there are tens of thousands of material suppliers. So how do you work with that whole, you know, thousands of puzzle pieces to really re-architect how the industry works? So if you can take off the sensors, uh, how does uh, reimagining capitalism kind of fit into that architect architectural innovation that's needed? So Darcy, I, I just want everyone in the room to be aware that you've actually done this. I just study it and write about it. So <laughs> I feel a little bit uncomfortable here, but, uh, but let me go. Um, I think you said it. We need both incremental innovation. Let's take what we do and do it a bit better. Let's pay people a bit more, give them more power, promote more people of varied backgrounds, clean up the factories. We need to do that. It's not sexy. It's incredibly important. Just cleaning up our act. We need radical breakthrough goals, as you suggest. Really a new way of thinking about what we're trying to accomplish and where we're trying to get. But doing the work, doing the hard work of really shifting the system in the way we're talking about, means putting the pieces of the puzzle together in a new way. And that requires collaboration, creativity, openness, the continual ability to be aware that we don't know what the end point is. We're gonna try and try again, try and try again. And I think this is one of the reasons the self-work is so important 
Because if we go into these problems and moments with our old assumptions about what's important and who I am and where we start, we're not going to be able to do this much more system wide kind of change. And I think, you know, I, I am, I'm sure I say this in the book, that the secret weapon we have is exactly our focus on the infinite game, not the finite game. Mm -hmm. That when you lose that it's about this year, my bottom line and me in favor of it's about us and the next 20 years and the whole world or the industry or even just my community that gives you a very different place to stand to solve these kinds of problems um so i think that that's good news yeah i totally agree and the other thing is just recognizing that all change really has to start local and then build from there please please yes um and so if you're asking me the like how do you do it on tomorrow very carefully with starting local well-defined teams well-defined goals give people room to fail try it out and try it out again and remember that you don't manage change like you manage ordinary operations that sounds so basic but it's so tempting to say oh you're the change team here's your goals here's your resources we expect progress by thursday That's and right. real change is is always messier and less certain than the stuff we already know how to do I totally agree. One last comment, then May, I'll throw it over to you. Uh, but this idea of a moonshot going big, I mean, that really is the definition. And it's time for moonshots. And as they say, we know we're going there, but we don't really know how we're going to get there. And so it's that rapid prototyping, trying, failing, learn from that and move on. But we've got to really align our purpose, our mission, our vision on, we need, we need big plays right now. But and does, fighting is, goes in. Yeah, isn't, isn't that always a kind of subtle balance? It because is. if you make the goal too far away, people look at you and go, I'll just wait until that goes away. You right. Know? right. So it has to be conceivable that we could get there. If we exactly. really used everything we had, we could get there. It, ha it has to resonate with, I think, the hearts of of people who charged with, with making the leap. I, I totally agree. And that's part of, I believe, a regenerative leader's role is to be able to hold both the current reality and that vision. We can't lose that vision. And um, I, I agree, we have to have the balance. What do we have to do today? What's it time for right now? But let's not lose that big vision. If I could choose just one leadership quality, this is the one I might choose, which is the ability to think about what needs to be done this week mm -hmm. and the problems and the issues and the people and how we do that with that larger sense of where we're trying to get to and how what we do this week will help us in that direction. And that, yes. that's, that's really, a, that's the trick. Yeah. I think, I think that's really important. And I'm glad that you added the future vision piece, because I think the danger of focusing on the week from a, a past perspective or a previous worldview is that we're going to try and solve these problems from the same worldview or mindset that created them. And so we need that space to be able to think about, um, you know, and imagine a world that might seem impossible to us right now, or, you know, that seems far fetched, but really believe that we can, we can get there and be able to do things in the, the day, you know, the daily and the weekly tasks, but still have that future vision. Um, I also just, you know, I kind of want to pull out some threads that I'm seeing that I love from this conversation. I love the, the shift in perspective from the short term profits to the long term vision and impact that we're having. Um, the increase in importance in, of being among leaders that you're seeing. I think that's really inspiring that you're seeing that in your work because we often do get so wrapped up in just the doing. And I think that's when we run the risk of, of uh, acting based on, you know, old patterns that might not be serving us. Uh, and it makes me think, you know, what role do you see female leadership playing in making this transition? Or do you see a role in that at all? I have a husband and a son, and they're both very engaged in social change. And so I hesitate to make 
big generalizations on the basis of gender. But let me proceed to do so anyway. <laughs> So my apologies in advance to those of you who may not be female or may not hold yourself to be female. Uh, may, um, because as I say, you know, the people I love in my life are male and uh, many, many of the people I work with are male. But I do think there is a role for women here. Mm -hmm. One is simply structural. Many women um, and many men, some men too, but many women find themselves raising families, doing the community work, holding the larger relationships. And I think that as a, again, a horrible generalization makes, gives many women a kind of way to accept that, oh, it's about the longer term and it's about the community in a way that is sometimes harder for some men who've been acculturated in, you know, run like crazy, it's about you, that's how you contribute. And again, I'm talking stereotypes, but stereotypes have power. And so I think there is an important role for women to hold that longer term and sense of community. Now, of course, we won't get anywhere unless everybody eventually holds that perspective. And there are many men that do. But I think that, that, that women do have, have that kind of role. I think also, again, is generalizations. And I know many women who are very goal oriented and very focused um, and very successful. But Women sometimes, because they've historically been marginalized in many settings, and of course, many people have been marginalized, let's be clear on this. I'm a hugely privileged, privileged white person. Um, so to talk about myself as marginalized is a bit weird. But on the other hand, when I was given tenure at MIT, one of my senior faculty said to me, well, Rebecca, you're the first woman we didn't have to hold our nose for, you know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, Darcy, they did. <laughs> um, so I think, I think being female sometimes just gives us like we're a little bit at the edge. And that gives us an advantage in maybe this isn't working that well. I think we share that with if you had asked me the same question, what about people of color? Um, I think there's you know, that sense of creativity and this is really not working. I think it can come from many people who've historically been marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, but in that sense, I do think women may have a very important role to play as leaders. Yeah, thank you for bringing in the entire marginalized community, because I do see that being an important shift in regenerative leadership is that it's not top down and it's not the power isn't staying in the people you know, in the people that are already at the top of the system, but it's shifting and it's empowering people who've been marginalized to uh, create change and really um, shift, shift the system in those ways. And I do, I think, I think female leadership plays a role in that. But also, like you said, I don't think the feminine is bound just to women. You know, I think we all carry feminine and masculine qualities and leadership historically has been masculine. However, you know, I think it could benefit from some feminine qualities that ideally, like you said, would be more balanced in all of us. Well, now I want another cup of coffee, May, because, you know, the whole question about the balance between the masculine and the feminine. And in some ways, as we talk about regeneration, we're talking about reclaiming aspects of the feminine, which, as you say, I think exist in all of us. But, you know, sometimes very successful women are described as daughters of the father because they learned how to play that kind of game. They internalized a more masculine perspective. So I think there's an overall question about rebalancing energy. And that's really tough. I mean, if we think historically about how feminine energy has been degenerated and derogated in so many ways, that, that's another big lift. But we didn't say this was going to be easy. Yeah, you know, I just want to uh, jump in here. In the Magnolias, we talk about the SDGs and goal number five, sustainable development goal number five is gender equality. And many have termed that goal as the booster goal to achieve all of the other ones. I love that. And, you know, to create space and to help support getting all these voices in across ethnic ethnicities. And um, that's something that we we really um, strive to do. It's part of our vision. So and the, Darcy, I, I'm super embarrassed to ask this. Is there a, an STG on 
ethnic or racial equality as well? There is, there's many different ones that include uh, equality. Uh, the 17th one is about peace. And the, the, the final statement of the SDGs is leave no one behind. Okay, okay. Because I, I think, I, I mean, a couple of people in the chat have made the comment that this in many ways is reclaiming the perspective of indigenous people. And, and I think if we had full gender equality and real racial and ethnic equality, and by that, like leaving no one behind, everyone included, everyone at the table, everyone powerful, that would, that would be a booster rocket, like, wow, <laughs> you know, yes. really make a difference. Yeah, and, and the one other thing I want to bring in, we talked about this a little bit in our breakout, but bringing the word and the concept of love and well-being into our leadership and Umberto Maturana, the Chilean biologist, you know, some of his research showed that love is the only emotion that actually enhances intelligence. And love <laughs> is that recognition that you are a significant other. Um, so it's something to think about. Oh, Darcy, I, I don't use the word love in the classroom. I mean, <laughs> But that's an example of how our whole language is permeated with a particular worldview. Exactly. And, you know, where do we need to go? Yes, we need to, we need to let ourselves go. We need to learn to love the world and each other and put that into practice in our lives. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, that's not currently on the MBA curriculum. <laughs> but it could be. It, it could be. So you see, you see an opportunity, but I, I think that's an example of when you start including a much wider range of perspectives um, that, that it's in the room. And of course, I gave the example of Bob Chapman, treat every employee as if they were your precious child. Yes. He's exactly. essentially saying manage with love. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Unfortunately, we need to transition now so that we have time for breakouts for people to engage in these topics themselves. So uh, I have a question that came to mind, but I'd just love to ask either of you, Darcy or Rebecca, do you have a prompt for the breakouts that is stirring in you from our conversation? It's okay if you don't. I have one too. I just wanted to see if there's anything that... Oh... Um, I always like the prompt, well, what are you going to do on Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, um, where do you find the energy that keeps you going? Mm. Do you know? Yeah, it's, that's, they kind of both touch on what I was thinking, which is, you know, how can you integrate these ideas into your leadership role toward bringing us, uh, toward building a regenerative future? That's good. Yeah, at the the other thing I was thinking yesterday or two days ago, we interviewed a woman, uh, a brilliant woman, Darshita Gillis, who grew up in abject poverty in India and is now um, just an amazing leader in finance, business, consulting uh, in London. And she said, you know, how do we bring others? into this work who are so often marginalized, who don't see a future. And she said, my mantra has always been, live life from your vision, not your circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the other well, question well, is- What's what tricky about that, yeah. What's tricky about that, Darcy, is there are structural inequities. There are, absolutely. You know, absolutely. and that can sound a little like it's your fault, you're poor and depressed. Mm. Um, and it's always more complicated. Than point. That. It yeah. is, it <laughs> right. is. And working in systems, the structural <clears throat> aspects that hold these current systems in place, that's where a lot of the real work is, but we right. have to recognize what those are first. Right. No, completely with you. Okay. Um, I'm going to send us into breakouts now. I'm going to go with with the prompt that I think captures kind of what both of you have shared, which is how can you integrate these ideas into your leadership role toward building a regenerative future? You can think about the practical space of, you know, like Rebecca said, what can you do on Tuesday 
um, to help have this impact and take the conversation where it wants to go. So you'll have about 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll bring you back into the group for some Q&A time. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, hopefully that was a nice lively conversation. Now we have an opportunity to you know, bring some people's voices into the larger group and expand the dialogue with Rebecca. So first of all, if there's anything that came up in your breakout that you wanna share with the larger group, please put it in the chat. If you have any specific questions, you can do that as well. Obviously we won't be able to get to everyone, but um, Rebecca will be able to respond to some of your guys' questions specifically. Uh, and it, we had a chance to review the chat during the breakouts and it seems like there was you know, quite the response to Darcy's comment around love and bringing that into the conversation. And so we wanted to just give Darcy and Rebecca a minute to respond to that. And so you know, the question for each of you, Darcy, you know, we'd love to learn from your experience, how have you integrated love into these sustainability conversations? And then Rebecca, if you were to envision bringing love into the business school curriculum, what role might that play and, and how could that look? Sure. Um, so love really does play a central central role in everything that we do um, within the Magnolias, how we approach everyone. And where it first really came into my own work and my own approach was back at Nike uh, in the early days when Sustainability was still a really tough word. It was misused, it was abused, it was overused, and people just ran from it sometimes. Uh, I think in large part because they didn't really understand it and business as usual was working really well for them. And so I found that um, when I would hit a particular leader and their brick wall around sustainability, I would reframe it and just ask them, you know, what do you personally love in the world? What do you want to conserve? And, you know, it was often, well, I love the water or I love to ski. And so I would say, okay, well, let's talk about how our current business model is impacting climate, it's impacting water, it's impacting the ocean, and to really make it personal and to make them think about, oh, so my decisions actually have a negative impact on something I love, wait a minute. And so that would change the, the conversation and really give them a way to engage from a place that um, had meaning to them. May I, I was struck by the resonance with the idea of bringing love in, in the chat. And also by the questions that said, well, this is all very well, but what about systemic racism or institutionalized misogyny? And so I really resonate with, with what Darcy said. And indeed, my understanding is that at Unilever, when Paul Polman was trying to move the whole firm, he put something like the top 5,000 people through purpose workshops where everyone spent time thinking about what they really cared about in the world, what they really loved. But then because they were doing it in groups, he was trying to change the whole culture. So he put them into groups so you could look across the room and go, oh, you really care about the world. Or you really care about kids that need help or people who are dying. And, and it really tried to move the entire organization to operate from this very, very different place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I joked, well, we don't use the word love in, in the MBA curriculum, but of course we do because there are hundreds and hundreds of MBA fac of, of business school faculty who are trying to help this change. And so we teach cases about CEOs who use the word love all the time. Um, we treat, we uh, use cases about institutional racism and the structure of the banking system and why people at the margins of the system have, you know, a huge handicap as they try and, and, and contribute. And, I think you can, let me put it this way, it's not enough to simply discover your own personal purpose or feel your own love or feel connected, although that's the absolute first step. You then have to go out and act and work on the structures in which we're embedded. There's a wonderful quote in the chat about, uh, from I think it's Peter Bloom, real change comes from small group meeting, one small group meeting at a time. So what are the levers that you have in your own workplace, in your own community that you can work to change that will embed 
move love more to center stage. And so the personal and the political, it's an old idea, but it's still true. Yeah, thank you both for sharing those different perspectives. So Rebecca, you now have a chance to respond to some of the questions that have been shared in the chat. There's like? so many fantastic questions, but there was one in particular I wanted to to pick up on a more more general question. And um, Andy Middleton, if if you're still on the call, I, I'd be super curious to know um, how you see the role of business in driving systems change because you've been so central to the systems change efforts across the UK. And I'm in awe of what's been accomplished in Wales, for example, and, and just think it's incredibly exciting. Um, do I come across as hopelessly naive when I say, well, business can be an ally or is there something there? How, how do you think about that question? Great, Thank, no, thanks Rebecca and a pleasure, pleasure to share a couple of experiences. So I think one of the one of the really interesting things is you know Wales is this west coast of the UK country, three million people, but it has this amazing suite of legislation called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which places a duty on the whole of public sector to maximise the contribution they make to a set of seven wellbeing goals, rather than just one, and it's starting to make a really big difference by the way that we make decisions, like in a billion pound road infrastructure gets refused on climate targets and. It's people are starting to get used to making it really make a difference. And I guess one of the things that one of the things that really interests me is that the sexy stuff is taught, you know, someone talked the other day about you know, everyone talks about Patagonia, but nobody does it. Because they like to quote it or they talk about this. And I think for me, I'm really interested in the role of medium and smaller businesses because they're the guts of the economy in every country where most people work, where most business gets done. Yet they're hard to gather. And I think for me, that your point about small groups of people gathering for place-based change that can then start to coalesce and create bigger conversations. And what we've been doing in Wales is starting a project called the Wales Transition Lab, which is bringing people together from different sectors who've never spoken before. And oddly, the farming community has never ever spoken to the health community formally. And you know, the retailers like the Danons and the Unilevers who say we're all over health, have never ever been seen by health professionals in the same room. So there's lies being told somewhere about who's doing what. And so what we've tried to do is create a safe space for those people to go, oh, I didn't realize that you thought the same as me, to have a, set, a shared conversation about common goals that are those really big conversations about saying, how could we get to zero pollution in our rivers? How could we make an entire country food literate in 10 years? How could we halve the cost of type two diabetes? knowing that the goals are the right things to go for. But as you say, it's the small conversations where trust is built first. And there is that kind of sense of unconditional love in the room that you can make progress. So it's really, we're early days, but it feels really exciting. Thank you. Andy, that, that's just thrilling. Thank you very much. Let, let me add that I think one of the key levers to getting some of the small and medium sized businesses in the room or on this wavelength, and I completely agree that that's the heart of many economies and where most of the conversations are. One of the keys is again institutional. We haven't talked at all about metrics, about so-called environmental, social and governance metrics. But I think while we're convening the small group conversations with love at its heart, we also need to be asking business, you know, just what kind of impact are you having on the world? Um, how, what what is your environmental impact? What is your social impact? And here are some metrics you could use and here's support in using them. And so I think, again, it's this human transformation and institutional transformation at the same time, because without the act, right, you wouldn't have got many of these amazing conversations. So you're exactly practicing that, you know, it's all about human, but we need the institutional structure which enables that to happen. And that's, that's fantastic. Can I bring in one other piece here? Um, we were talking about urgency and you know, corporations can't change the world, but the world won't change without corporations. And sometimes you know, many people feel so disconnected from corporations. And so from an urgency and an inclusive perspective, you know, Rebecca, I'll throw this question to you. And we haven't talked about this. What are one or two things that everyone could do today or Tuesday uh, to help make the world a world where all of all beings thrive. 
What could everyone do? Uh, eat less meat. Check. And change your behavior to one or two important people. Um, think about the one thing that you can do to drive change in your workplace, in your community, in your school, in your family. Have the conversations if that's where you're at. Allocate the resources if you're a bit further on. Make it a priority. Do something, do something, do something. Oh, and yes, please vote. <laughs> get informed, get engaged, understand what's happening. Um, so many people think the most important thing they can do to address global warming is recycle. Recycling is not on the top 20. Eating less meat is probably number one, which is why I say it. But you know, what can you do? Um, Oh, I could say I could say a bunch more. There's so much to do, yeah. but that, that's a, a reasonable start. Fabulous. Thanks for that question, Darcy. And thanks, Andy, for jumping on and, and sharing your wisdom, too. Is there anyone else that has a question uh, for Rebecca? You can just unmute and start talking. Rebecca, I actually posed this question in the chat. I just finished reading Competing in the Age of AI which is from two of your colleagues at HBS heading the digital initiative. And if I can really bastardize a summary relative to this topic, it would go something like the following. Um, if you want to own a market, get the most data and apply AI to learn everything about making it easier for your customers to do what you want them to do and to do it again and again and again, and then run into all the adjacent areas that your data gets you into and enable them to do that easier and again and again and again. And at the end of that, you'll be the dominant firm in that industry and you will know your customers well enough to get them to do whatever you want instead of what they should be doing. Uh, most of the again and again and again stuff is stuff we need to do less of. And in fact, virtually all of it is stuff we need to do less of unless it's listening to music. I guess we, we could do more listening to music without damaging the, oh, the earth. I so what do you do in a situation where it's going to become harder and harder to shift these dominant firms to get them to make any kind of directional change as we see with the problems with Facebook right now? But it's not just just digital. It's it's the the finance companies. It's the furniture companies. It's the every company that is leveraging their data through these new what are called by World Economic Forum frontier technologies. And there's hundreds of people writing white papers about how frontier technologies are going to save us, whilst all of those firms are doing exactly the opposite. So I'm uh, chatting in um, a guy called Matt Stoddard. Mm -hmm. Anyone who cares about monopolization should be uh, t reading his, his column, you know, his email letter, it's fantastic. So David, I have something in my future you may not know. I was the government's lead witness in the Microsoft antitrust case. It's now 25 years ago, um, but I'm all over monopolization. And when I say, yes, love each other, yes, meet in small groups, we need regulatory change. You need to get educated. You need to vote. You need to be involved. This is what I mean. With the current rules of the game, it's not going to be fun the next 20 years. It really is not. Um, so we need to get sufficiently engaged and sufficiently educated that we can push for the kinds of regulations that will control what is otherwise, actually have a paper on this, um, AI leading to more and more centralization of power and information and control. And you Super put your dangerous. paper in the chat. Um, and, and if you could just summarize what regulations 
are we not even looking at that <laughs> no, would be critical? That I cannot do <laughs> five, four minutes before we do to end. It's a huge topic, huge, huge topic. People run conferences on it. We, in fact, um, put, we did it for the first year MBA class. We did Facebook and we did what are the regulatory solutions and how do you think about that? It's it's huge, but there, there's stuff out there I'd be happy to point I, you in. I've to been to those well. conferences. They don't answer the question. No, they don't. <laughs> but is, is that an excuse to stop working the problem? It's not an excuse. It's to an excuse to get problem. different conference runners. Well, well Rebecca, maybe different maybe. people. Anyway, there are lots more people who want to jump I'm gonna, in. I'm going to jump in here. Thank you, yeah. David. We have only time for one more person. So Claudine, I see your hand up. Please join us. And then Brian, Juan, and Bismarck, I'm sorry that we don't have time to get to you. Please put your questions in the chat so that everyone can hear them. And, and yeah. Oh, thanks, May. Um, Rebecca, uh, you said earlier it's absolutely possible to change and continue to have profits. I understood that you said that. So uh, my question would be, um, do you think it's possible to stay in the growth and profit paradigm and make the shift just by innovation or other means? Or is it necessary to also address overshoot, downscale, and revisit our approach to what we think is material sacrifice and start to focus more on Im immaterial gains? In the end, we have to get to a world that's in balance. So how do we do that? We can dematerialize growth. So there are lots of things that people want that don't necessarily mean more stuff, more elder care, more education, more entertainment. There are ways to dematerialize growth. There um, is enormous opportunity for innovation here to become more efficient it, um, and more creative in how we meet human needs. It is tempting to say, look, we just have to stop growing. And I think for those of us who are hugely privileged, live in the Western world, have everything we need, we absolutely should consume less, no question. How do we start moving in that direction? But let's remember for the vast majority of the world's population, alas, there are still billions of people who lack access to clean drinking water, reliable food, decent energy, light bulbs in their schools. Um, so we need to be careful about whose growth we're talking about. And I think the realistically, the only way to make progress is innovate, innovate, innovate. Um, and we can do that. I've, I studied innovation for 20 years. If we were really serious about this problem, moved a significant amount of money into R&D, changed the market signals so innovation was rewarded, we would see immense innovation happening incredibly quickly. Our case in point is solar, solar panels, of course, which is one sector where that was tried. And we've seen a reduction in cost far faster than anyone imagined possible. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks, thanks. Colin, for your question. So as our time comes to a close, I'm going to ask Rebecca to share a quote that she would like to share with the group. Sure. So um, I tend to be upbeat when I do these kinds of group meetings because I am fundamentally optimistic, not optimistic, I'm hopeful. I think humans are incredibly ingenious. The earth is so beautiful and so alive and that we will bring ourselves into alignment with each other and the earth. But there are times when I wake up feeling like, who am I kidding? This is going to be a really, really rough ride. And so my quote is from Carl Safina. He says, you dodge despair, not by taking the deluge of problems full bore. You focus on what can work, what can help, or what you can do, and you seize it. And then you don't let go. Mm. So don't get lost in thinking the problems are too big or it's impossible. Of course, none of us is going to change the world. There's nine billion of us and we're all going to die. Get focused on what you can do right now with the people you care about and the people you love. Thank you, Rebecca. So before we officially close, I'm going to guide us through just a very short integration exercise. So once again, get comfortable where you're seated and go ahead and close your eyes. And just take this opportunity to check in. 
Bring your awareness to your inner world and notice what's different now from when we started. What's moved inside of you or shifted? How might our conversation today have shifted your view on leadership? In what ways are you being called to lead in this moment? Think about one action that you can take in the next week that's going to take you one step closer to becoming that leader and that's going to take our planet one step closer to being regenerative. And as you're ready, you can open your eyes and join the group. And I invite you to write your action in the chat if it's something you're ready to commit to. I think Rebecca has been very inspiring in many ways. And in one of the big ways is the action piece and the empowering each of us to realize that we do have an impact. Uh, so now is the chance to voice what you're going to commit to do or ways that you're going to enhance your being so that it can be witnessed by the community as well. So I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank Rebecca for being here with us today and being in this lively, emergent conversation with Darcy and me. It really has been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Darcy, of course, and Magnolia Moonshot for co-hosting with us today and being in this space with us. It's meant a lot. Um, and of course, thanks to Adam for running the back end and being the initial brains behind this series. Uh, and thanks to all of you for showing up and playing in this space with us. There have been amazing contributions in the chat. I can't wait back. I can't wait to go back through it and read it all. We'll be sharing the recording. Um, we'll also share the chat with you too, so you won't miss those resources that have been shared. And then this is also the close of our eight part regeneration new work series. So thank you for all of you who have been on this journey with us and have been able to show up multiple times or even just one time, you know, you each individually make up this community. So thank you. Um, we, you know, have already started envisioning what the next series is going to look like. So stay tuned for that. Um, please stay connected through our LinkedIn group and connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, one of our intentions for this space is to build a, a lasting community of people who care about these topics and are doing wonderful work in this space. So please don't be strangers and we will hopefully see you all soon.